Across the country, ordinary Americans from all walks of life are taking whatever measures necessary to prepare. I'm preparing my family for the total destruction of the power grid. The Yellowstone supervolcano. A financial collapse. And protect themselves. When survival's the goal, it's into the spider hole. Go fast, 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 fast. Go, 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 go. From what they perceive is the fast approaching end of the world as we know it. So I'm gonna use like this. Next, we go inside the lives of three committed preppers who have devised extensive plans. There's some 600 tons of reinforcing steel in the structure. Gone to great lengths. We'll know when the government takeover has happened, when they actually knock on your door. Get on down, get on down! And made huge personal sacrifices to ensure their very survival. I've given up being socially acceptable. The experts will assess their extreme preps and decide if they have what it takes to face Armageddon. What wouldn't you do to protect your family? And to survive. Dude, you got fire! This is Doomsday Preppers. Over 20 years ago, Michael James Patrick Douglas left the Marine Corps and settled in Augusta, Maine, in search of a simpler life. Now he's a wilderness school instructor and lives on a 30-acre farm with his wife and three kids, where he's traded his battle fatigues for homemade buckskin and fast food for found food. This little groundhog, a car, took him out. If the hairs pop right out between the shoulder blades, the meat's too far gone, so I won't take it. Let's go eat. I've given up being socially acceptable. Guess what I got? Groundhog! Dun, dun, dun. So who wants some groundhog? All right. I'll have some, I'll have some. The reason I came to Maine was to get away from it all. I'm preparing for overpopulation to reach critical mass. Get on down, get on down! The global population first reached 1 billion in 1804. In only 200 years, the global population has soared from 1 billion to 7 billion. Researchers believe that the planet can only sustain a limited number of people. And Michael fears that we are fast approaching critical mass and will soon exceed the world's human carrying capacity. Overpopulation reaches critical mass. Soils will be depleted and turn into deserts. Once those deserts establish themselves, it's irreversible. Giant dust clouds turning the sky red for days will cover the landscape. What's going to happen? Massive food riots in the streets, violence. A gallon of water would cost more than a gallon of gas. For the past 20 years, Michael has sharpened his own survival skills. But to outlast an overpopulated world with scarce resources, he believes his entire family must become expert preppers too and learn to live from the land. I desperately want to teach my children everything they need to survive. Investing every waking hour in what I do leaves little, if any, room for making money, for college tuition for the children. But there's something that's more important than that. Today, uh, we're gonna wake up the kids and bring them out to the woods for the whole day, see where their skill level's at develop it to the point where I'm comfortable that they can survive all day. Hey, boys. Come on, the day started without you. Let's go. We're going out in the woods. No school today. <laughs> all right. My middle child, Ryan, of the three, he's the one who walks furthest from my path. It's important to have every member of the family on board if we are to survive as a family. The world's population rises by over 200,000 people every single day. Michael believes this rapid increase will cause massive food and water shortages. So his survival plan is dependent on getting back to the basics. The key to our survival is that we become that hunter-gatherer. Come on, Ryan. I am so thirsty. Well, if you're thirsty, what would you do to get water right here, buddy? And get water from the sink. How about using sphagnum moss? If overpopulation caused water to become polluted or inaccessible, this ordinary plant 
could save them from dehydration. It's nature's sponge. What you do is you grab a whole bunch of it, and usually it's you can squeeze it right into your mouth and get water. You want to try it? You need to know how to do this so you can keep alive. Without water, in two to three days, you're dead. Do you understand? Two to three days? Yeah. So you willing to try it or what? Look up. There you go. Good stuff? Mm. Funky flavor. Well, it'll keep you alive. Because the Douglases live on a farm that produces food and have 400 gallons of water caches, Michael fears they could become a target in an overpopulated world. So he has developed his very own alarm system to warn them of dangerous marauders in search of provisions. Out here in the rural areas, people are going to be spilling out to, to take what farmers have. I'm not going to allow my family to be a target. I've had the opportunity to play with thermal imagery cameras, motion detectors, um, early detection systems of all kinds. You know what I use? Bird feeders. Birds alarm at the most subtle of threats. By listening to the bird alarms, you have awareness of people approaching. Every bird produces a different sound, and each of their calls communicates a particular meaning, a language Michael has studied for over two decades and is now passing on to his children. What's that? Not hatch. What's Chippy. that? Good. Today, Michael is teaching Emily about the importance of the robin's distress call which he believes could give the family a full five minutes to prepare for any approaching danger. All right, this one's not out, but tell me what it is, because it's really important. Ready? Robin's alarm? Yeah, know that one. That means somebody's coming with a lot of angry energy, OK? Um, when you have a kid who can hear that 300 yards away in the din of society, their awareness is amped. Most preppers stock up on firearms for self-defense, but Michael does not possess guns. He believes that overpopulation would cause ammunition to become a finite resource, and he does not want to be dependent on it. You don't need to rely on bright, shiny objects like knives and other you know, guns. Instead, plug into the landscape to see what it can offer you. Instead, his lethal weapon of choice is made simply from an oak tree and a railroad spike. Nice, other side. Excellent. Take it and chop it right to the base of the head. Boom. Dakota has practiced throwing tomahawks for over seven years, and he also has martial arts training. Today, Michael is combining both of these skills to teach Dakota a new tomahawk technique that he could use to fight potential invaders inside their home. Right, guiding your hand. Boom, you're holding the blades, and now you have your, your blocks, your strikes, your long distance. Just remember, lethal, Hold the blade, non-lethal, all right? This is crowd control, escape. This is, there's nowhere else to go but life or death. Your sister and brother are too young. Don't share that stuff with them. One day I hope to uh, be as good as he is, if not better. Although the tomahawk is the most dangerous weapon on the Douglas's farm, it is not the only one. Like a true prepper, Michael always has a plan B. This is as powerful as a shotgun. Really try to take out one of these targets. Yes. A throwing stick is a handmade wooden tool with a sharpened end. When thrown sideways, it is an effective hunting weapon for small games, such as rabbits. Sidearm, just like a martial arts punch. It's the spinning action of this stick that, when it hits, creates all that force. You want to do a throwing stick with us? <sighs> no, I'm good. All right, go ride your bike. Everybody needs this. Who doesn't want their children to come home alive? But for Michael, offensive training is not enough. He wants his kids to be ready for danger at any moment, whether they have a weapon or not. So he conducts self-defense drills every day, multiple times a day, and often without warning. My kids are in there playing right now, so what I want to do is uh, give them kind of an awareness drill. You know, this is how they start to evolve their skill sets. So, with that in mind, let's go have some fun. Hey, 
Hands in the air. Hands in the air now. What do you do? Both hands. Both hands. Get him down. Get him down. All right. All right. Good. Not bad. Yeah, not that bad for a two-year-old. I get moments where people think that I'm crazy or uh, too far gone all of the time. Is it all worth it? <sighs> yeah. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Michael Douglas is determined to prepare his entire family for an overpopulated world. But is his reluctant 12-year-old son, Ryan, ready? All right, so are you up for it? Uh, I guess so, yeah. I, I want to know, not I guess so, yes or no. What Next, Michael puts him to the prepping off. test of his life. Three, two, one. Michael James Patrick Douglas is preparing for overpopulation to decimate our planet's resources and change the way we live forever. 200 people are born every single minute worldwide, so Michael spends countless hours each day preparing his children for an overcrowded world. But not all of them are following in his prepping footsteps. Ryan, when he kind of drags his feet and hangs behind his brother and sister, it's so hard to not get frustrated. If my family is going to survive, Everybody needs to be on board. Hey, little man. Oh. Can we talk? Yeah. Today, Michael is having a father-son talk with his 12-year-old son, Ryan. He believes it is time for him to be put to the ultimate family test. I've been uh, thinking about your rite of passage. The rite of passage that my children go through is the recognizing that they have the essential skills in order to survive. The two key things for your rite of passage are going to be your shelter and your fire. If overpopulation causes food and water shortages, Michael believes his family may have to seek out resources further from home. But hunting and gathering on foot during the main winter, when temperatures can reach 50 below zero, could be life-threatening. Without shelter, you succumb to hypothermia. If I do, do I get a prize? Yeah, the prize is that you're able to survive. I need to know all the different skills that he teaches me. Like, for the food, pizza, fire, matches, water, sink. Not drinking out of moss. All right, so are you up for it? Uh, I guess so, yeah. I, I want to know, not I guess so, yes or no? Yes. All right. Come on, let's go. It is absolutely vital that Ryan learn how to build shelter. It is the first priority in physical survival. Michael wants Ryan to build a shelter without relying on store-bought prepping tools. Instead, he'll have to use just what he can find in the woods. A lot of preppers get so infatuated with new toys. They're temporary conveniences that will eventually rust, fall apart, break, get lost. We're gonna need some ribbing, so gather these stout branches, okay? As many as you can get. First step is to set up your ridge pole, and then we'll put the ribs on. What we need to do is create a tripod interlocking these fork sticks together. Ryan and Michael are building a debris hut, a small shelter that can be assembled in almost any location and works by insulating human body heat under hundreds of layers of leaves. All of this debris is to keep your body heat close to you, so we want the inside to be really tight and small. Once you get enough leaves, you're going to be able to stay warm well below freezing in nothing but a pair of shorts and a t-shirt Inchworm yourself in. Knowing that shelters like this could one day save his life, Michael spends an average of 40 nights a year constructing and sleeping in debris huts. Okay, here we go. He can assess how weatherproof they are with one simple foolproof test. Three, two, one. Any leaks or drips? No. Come on out, let's see what you look like. Not bad, little man. Good job. Ryan has successfully proved that he can build a shelter, but to complete his rite of passage, he will have to show his dad that he can create light, warmth, and heat to cook the day's hunt. He'll have to make a fire. When you can manifest fire off the landscape, you don't have to worry about oil. Fire equals cooked food, light, warmth. Ryan must start a fire using only a bow drill and a piece of notched wood all items that can be easily made from the natural environment. Don't give up now. You're doing it. You got a coal. Check it out. Check it out. Okay, buddy. 
You stay calm. You stay calm. Here, here. I'm going to dump it carefully into your tinder bundle. Just very, very gently squeeze the uh, sides of the tinder bundle like a taco. Okay. Blow hard. Blow harder. <sighs> through it. Through it. Dude, you got fire, little man. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. That's your fire. That's a good fire. You're entering a new stage of your life. You're no longer a little kid anymore, You're turning into a young man. This here is your umbilical cord. When the Douglas children prove they can survive an overpopulated world, they are presented with their own umbilical cord, which has been preserved in cedar wood and sweetgrass since their birth. It represents your attachment to me and mom. But today you proved that you're a survivor and that you're ready to take the next step. So I'm giving it to you. It signifies that you're your own person right now, All right? These abilities that you showed me today are proof that you are a survivor. I hope you pursue it because our family's counting on you. When it hits the fan, our family's plan is not to survive, but to sur thrive. Michael, the experts, practical preppers, believe that being accustomed to living off the land puts you way ahead of the preparedness curve. It will be invaluable to you and your family. However, given the climate in Maine, we are concerned what food you are able to grow during the winter months. The point about our food shortcomings through winter, spot on. Since the departure of the Nat Geo film crew, we've emphasized endurance training, strength training, and conditioning to include acclimatization in harsh environments. While the Earth's population has more than doubled since 1959, the United Nations predicts that growth will begin to slow in the next century and level at 10 billion by the year 2100. Real estate developer Larry Hall is building luxury survival condos guaranteed to help you and your family survive everything from solar flares to a polar shift, if you could afford the million dollar price tag. Show that is a water tank. Larry Hall is an engineer turned real estate developer. His latest investment property is located on the picturesque plains of Kansas a luxury condominium complex complete with a gym, pool, and a movie theater. Hey, Joe. The water tank's coming good? Yeah. I've been around uh, the building industry my whole life. I've built everything from uh, residential properties up through it, including high-tech uh, military and industrial applications. See, we got concrete in the hall? See that? See that? That's a milestone, man. It's been a long time coming. But Larry's not building a normal condo complex. I'm building a luxury survival condominium to protect against solar flare, worldwide economic collapse, or anything Mother Nature can throw at us. Something's going on. Things aren't as normal as they were. And so that caused a great concern for me. The survival condo project is a one-size-fits-all solution to solar flares and loss of the grid, avian bird flu, you know, nuclear explosion, earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruptions. When complete, this 14-story high-rise will protect up to 70 preppers within its walls, including Larry himself. I've got a family. I have a wife and a, a six-year-old son. When you become a parent, suddenly you aren't the most important thing anymore. It makes me feel responsible and in having to prepare. To protect his condo residents from the devastation and social chaos that he believes could follow anything from a solar flare to nuclear war, Larry has hidden the entire condo complex completely from sight. You don't want it to be a convenient target for uh, possible marauders or population centers to be attracted to. So this high rise is not being built up, it's being built down. You know, it's a 14-story building embedded in uh, nine foot of concrete, uh, 175 feet into the ground. And this is no ordinary hole in the ground. It is a former nuclear missile silo built in the 1960s at the height of the Cold War. 
This was designed to house an intercontinental ballistic missile that was capable of reaching the Soviet Union. It was designed to open and lift the missile to the surface where it could then be launched. This formidable concrete shell was designed to withstand a direct nuclear strike and can take 100 pounds of pressure per square inch, which is equivalent to a storm with over 1,500 mile per hour winds. There's some 600 tons of reinforcing steel in this structure. So if there were a super tornado out here, um, life would be uninterrupted for the uh, survivalists that would be inside here. In Larry's condos, you're supposed to feel like you are on vacation, not like you're surviving doomsday. We've got uh, a swimming pool. We've got exercise rooms. We have a library and classroom. We've got a movie theater. We've got a bar and lounge in here. But luxury comes at a price. Larry has sunk $3 million and counting into this large hole to ensure that his preppers get only the best. We have dual fuel ranges, high-end countertop materials, bamboo renewable wood floors. But believing that anything from an economic collapse to a pandemic could threaten basic services like food, water, and electricity, Larry has customized many prepper-specific extras to ensure the post-apocalyptic survival of his clients. Some of the features that we've had to design into the survival condominium that you would not see in a normal building include redundancy for key life support structures like redundant water systems. This morning, on my way into uh, the uh, water tank manufacturer. The average American uses a staggering 100 gallons of water each day, enough to fill 1,600 drinking glasses. So if an earthquake, tsunami, or nuclear war caused the country's water supply systems to break down, Larry has a backup plan. Wow! Now, Joe, that is a water tank. That's what you ordered. Planning on furnishing with several drinks of water, and I believe that'll do the job. The 25,000 gallons of water stored in these tanks is enough to fill a small swimming pool. And if rationed, Larry believes it will allow his 70 prepper residents to survive safely cocooned in the missile shaft for several months. With the threats that are out there, a lot of these investors really wanted to have 25,000 gallons as a minimum buffer. And this gives them a reservoir that's independent of everything else, regardless of what happens to any other supply. So it'll probably be ready for installation within the next couple weeks. That puts a lot of minds at ease. The people in the United States are so used to this machine that we call our society being able to provide for them. And when that machine breaks, people get desperate, people get hungry, and that escalates the snowball of civil unrest. Worried that his luxury condos will become a post-apocalyptic target, Larry has devised a half a million dollar four-stage security plan. Stage one is a seven-foot high perimeter fence that will act as an initial barrier to ward off attackers. Harry, Larry, did I just see this gate move on its own? Finally, yes. You just made my day. It's only taken, what, three weeks now? You want those? I'm sure. I do want these. Make sure you push the right button, the large the button. The large, you made it idiot proof for me. Well, perfect. I'm not sure we can solve that problem, but. <laughs> Security stage two is a complex surveillance system that monitors both the perimeter and interior of the underground complex and is designed to alert residents to any break in of the site. We're going to put state of the art electronics. We have a fingerprint scanner, biometric system, motion sensors throughout the whole facility. There'll be cameras everywhere. Uh, there'll be more cameras probably than the White House. I don't know. If the outer defenses are breached by attackers, stage three is the protruding entrance of the missile silo itself. You're shooting at a concrete structure that's nine feet thick. You're going to run out of ammunition. And if anyone is determined enough to get through stages one, two, and three, Larry's last line of defense is his own army of preppers, the 70 battle-ready residents of his condo. The exact quantity of weapons that we have is covered by some confidentiality agreements, but we have everything from handguns, uh, shotguns, to automatic rifles. We have ammo well in excess of uh, tens of thousands of rounds, so we could fight a small war. Larry has thought through every detail of apocalypse living, but none of it means anything if he can't make a sale. Next, Larry takes a potential resident on the home tour of her life. Well, now that you've seen it, 
um, how do you feel about your interest level? On the windy plains of Kansas, real estate developer and engineer Larry Hall is building a luxury apartment building for an unusual clientele, preppers who want to escape the end of the world. The people that are contacting us are concerned about a global economic collapse, a terrorist threat, the climate change wiping out the majority of our food production, a pole ship, a meteorite or comet strike. We've gotten everything here, and uh, this facility is not just a single event type thing. But to buy your way out of the apocalypse, you'll need spare change to the tune of one or two million dollars the price of a palatial six-bedroom mansion in Kansas City. Today we have a prospective buyer. It's our first visit to the site. We're uh, gonna show her where we are in the construction process. Sarah is a suburban mom living in central Kansas. Today, she is driving to Larry's missile site to see if doomsday luxury is all it's cut out to be. You can't ignore everything from the weather changes, whether they be natural cycles or whether they be something more serious. I think it's just the beginning of what we're looking at. Because of security concerns, Sarah has requested that her identity not be revealed on camera. A lot of the people that are interested in this project want to be somewhat anonymous. So certainly they don't want to be filmed. My worst case scenario would, would be a nuclear war or a biological war. I'm, I'm wanting to put myself and my family in an environment that we will be as safe as possible. Many Americans can identify with Sarah's sense of impending dread. A recent poll found that 41% of Americans feel that preparing for a disastrous event is more important than saving for retirement. And over half believe some kind of catastrophic event will occur in the next 10 years. Hi, Sarah. Hi. You ready to see the project? I am ready to see the project. I've read about it. Now it's time to see it. Great. I'm glad you're here. Let's go inside. With over $3 million invested in this project and a potential $2 million sale riding on this meeting, the stakes for Larry are high. We have seven residential levels. We've got a movie theater and a bar and a lounge down here. Sarah is eager to know exactly how much she will have to give up for the apocalypse. Now, some, some of the luxuries that I guess in a, in a lockdown situation you would expect to give up would be cable, internet, satellite TV, you're the first person Computer, that's asked, internet. You're the first like, person that's How am I going to log into my Facebook? <laughs> well, actually, we have some specialized servers that keep snapshots of web pages on the internet. Right, OK. Are you ready to go see the units? I am. Let's go take a look. This is a formidable door. Inside Larry's condos, life is set up to feel as normal as possible in spite of the end of days raging outside. On this way, watch your step. Every tenant in Larry's building will go to work each day. The normalcy of your day-to-day -day operations is important. So everyone in here would have to work a minimum of four hours a day with the regular preventative maintenance and manning the security desks and things like that. And on the way back to their condo, they can stop off at the local supermarket to pick up their groceries. The level that we're on here, this is the general store. And it'll, it'll be set up like a general store. You'll see sundries around, and there'll be. It allows you to still feel like you're, you're going to the your... store on your way home from work to Ex grab what you're fixing for dinner. Exactly. Okay. You're actually socializing and going through the same motions that you would normally. Normally. OK. Yep. We have a combination of freeze-dried and dehydrated uh, food sources, uh, 60 months per person, which is five years. And that's on about a 2,500 calorie per day calculation. So that's a pretty formidable food reserve by itself. Now, this is the, the highest of the seven residential floors. This also happens to be my space that uh, my condo is being built in. In true life fashion, my wife and I haven't uh, agreed on a floor plan for our <laughs> unit yet. <laughs> yeah, so, I can imagine. You can see that it's a pretty big space. With the tall ceilings, you don't feel exactly. all that closed in. I, I can, you know, the 10 foot, that extra of the vertical real estate. Exactly. We consulted with some psychologists that um, gave us some really useful advice or, to how to prevent um, getting cabin fever or going stir crazy. Larry's ceilings are two feet higher than the standard eight feet seen in most American homes. And research has shown that just this small difference can actually make people feel less constrained and even happier.
you know, it's a very comfortable space. And though Larry's prepper condos are 175 feet underground, his buyers still have a choice of view to consider. The artificial windows will be really fun. Larry's electronic windows can look out on any view you want. Can I be on a beach? You could be on a beach. <laughs> okay. You could be at San Francisco Harbor. You could live in an aquarium. You could live on the space station. Okay, all right. But will Larry's extensive food, water, and security preps sell Sarah on the apocalyptic dream? Well, now that you've seen it and you have a, a, an appreciation for what's involved here, um, how do you feel about your interest level? I, honestly, my interest level is up quite a bit. You know, I need to discuss with my family. I think it's important for me to let you know that I have at least 12 people that are in an active state of question and answers, that high interest level is being driven by the threats that we're seeing in the world right now. Right. Everything seems to be picking up, so. It's what pushed me to this point this fast, so yeah. I, I can understand that. You're not alone. At the end of another 14-hour long day on site, Larry and his construction team are finally taking the time to crack open a beer and discuss their own fears about the end of days. I think the solar flares are the worst threat. You're losing a big part of the power grid is what would deteriorate on so many levels. People do not know how to take care of themselves anymore. Yep. They are totally dependent upon the city, the state, the government. Things can get bad really quick. That's what scares me the most. You know, what wouldn't you do to protect your family? You would, you would do things that you wouldn't normally do. Yeah, that's, I, that's scary to think about, the fact that you might. Exactly. The answer is be prepared because you don't want to deal with the alternative. So well said. That's where we're at. Very well said. Larry, the experts think your facility is extremely well prepped, and anyone who is able to secure a unit will have better peace of mind in case of a catastrophic event. Okay. However, you should think about recruiting inhabitants with advanced skill sets, including those with medical and military training. I agree 100% with that comment. We, we attempted to do just that, but given the uh, economic conditions that we have today, um, that option became overcome by events, for lack of a better term. Since that Geo was here, we've had five offers for purchasing various units. We're getting a lot of activity in that uh, area of the project, and uh, we hope to close some deals pretty soon. Becky Brown believes that the United States government will declare martial law and take away basic human rights from all American citizens. She has spent $50,000 prepping in fear of a government takeover. But how prepared is she? Becky Brown is a 30-something living in Salt Lake City, where she is in her last semester of business school. Yes. Oh, hey. hey. Oh, hey, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. What are we talking yeah. about today? So I thought that for today's study group that we could talk about something we haven't talked much about, which is the government is not doing very well right now. A big portion of the public in the U.S. is unemployed. Because of our nation's high unemployment rate, Becky believes that the economy will collapse, causing the government to forcibly take over and declare martial law, which would dismantle democracy and strip American citizens of their basic constitutional rights. Regular citizens have no idea what's going on. I just study things and put the clues together and go, hmm, I foresee the government takeover happening within the next year or two, honestly. I think that we have more problems in our government as a whole right now than ever before. They could literally come in with the army, call martial law. The city would look like chaos. The highways and the roads will be shut off because they're going to mandate who goes where. We won't have a water supply. They're going to hold the water for the most elite. We're going to be left surviving on our own with what we have already. We'll know when the government takeover has happened, when they actually knock on your door. And it's gonna come by surprise. And then we'll wake up the next morning going, should have bought some food storage. <laughs> I've spent close to $50,000 prepping, 30,000 in the last year. I probably spend about four hours a day thinking about prepping. That has prevented me from being in a long-term relationship. When I'm not in school, I spend all day, every day, prepping. That's all I do. 
Becky's preparations influence all facets of her life, including her current location. She looked at several apartments and finally settled on her present home. I chose to live in this house particularly because the Capitol is literally right in my backyard. Having the Capitol right behind me is a constant reminder that the government could declare martial law and take over the city. So it's a blessing that I'm living so close to be able to put the clues together. Many preppers do not disclose they have emergency supplies in fear of becoming a target. But Becky believes that collaboration is key to surviving a government takeover. So she's invited her close friends, Isaac and Spencer, and new acquaintance, Victoria, for an informal gathering. You guys know that I'm into prepping, right? Yeah. And so um, I just wanted to invite you over to try and show you what I have. I'm afraid for my friends that don't prep. I have been thinking about preparing, but I just haven't ever done anything about it. I, I see that the government's getting more and more control, and I honestly think that there'll probably end up being martial law or government takeover declared. You kind of have to have a backup plan thought out ahead of time. I'm really concerned about my friends and family, and you know, I, I just want you guys to be prepared too. So do you want to see what I have? Yeah, yeah let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Becky lives in an 1,800 square foot apartment and has a 200 square foot room dedicated entirely to her preps. The room holds nearly 100 gallons of water and over 4,000 servings of long-term food. If the government takes over, we're gonna run out of food. The trucks are gonna stop moving. If the trucks stop moving in the country, we're not gonna be able to get the food from the farms to the stores. So we're gonna be stuck. You're gonna need food storage. And this stuff is awesome. They come in Mylar bags. Mylar bags are commonly used in prepping because they create a strong barrier against oxygen, allowing dehydrated foods to be stored for up to 20 years. Becky has 800 of these bags stowed away in what she calls grab-and-go buckets. With one of these grab-and-go buckets, it weighs 17 pounds. You know, just check it out. If you had to run with one of those, that would feed you for about two months, one person. Run with this? Who knows if they were to show up on our front doorstep and say, OK, you no longer live here. Becky believes that if martial law were declared, thousands of Salt Lake City residents would attempt to escape at the same time, which would make highways impassable and force them to travel by foot. You will be on foot at one time or another. It's, it's gonna be really important to have something. Turn around, Spencer. Bug out bag is also known as a 72 hour kit. So if you have to bug out or get out of town, you have a backup plan. Most preppers consider bug out bags a necessity and they are typically packed with food, water, and first aid supplies. Because Becky fears a takeover could happen at any time, Having one is simply not enough. I have several bug out bags. My big bug out bag usually stays at home, but I have smaller ones that I keep in my car. Anywhere I go, I always have that safety net. I take breaks unless you're being chased, but that would that would give you enough supplies for 72 hours. I could run you maybe flip it. about 50 feet with that. Yeah. Becky believes that the lack of resources available in a government takeover will incite civil unrest. So self-protection will be as important as having food and water. So you can imagine that when the government takes over, you're guarding your family, you're guarding your resources, you're guarding your food and water. People are gonna want to get at it that don't have it. My intent isn't to scare you, it's just to prepare you. So if you don't have a gun, then you can get something like this. I mean, it's pretty easy to go like oh, that and, yeah. <laughs> you know, it can, Put him out for about five minutes. <laughs> Becky's stun gun works using only a nine volt battery and can incapacitate an attacker by shocking them with up to 150,000 volts of electricity. That's a lot of electricity going through there. I thought it was illegal, it's not. She's always trying to convince other people to get into what she's doing. I hope they'll realize the value in it and start preparing on their own. I was very overwhelmed by the intensity of her preparedness but it's, it's, it made a lot more sense to me as it went on. With only a non-lethal weapon, how will Becky protect herself and her preps effectively? And what will the experts think?
Becky Brown has spent $50,000 preparing for a hostile government takeover in which she believes ordinary citizens will be deprived of basic necessities. She has five years of food storage and is prepping her friends for added support. But how will she defend her provisions from the violence she expects? Salt Lake City had over 13,000 property crimes in 2010. Becky fears that figure will only rise in a government takeover, as those who did not prepare take from those who did. To safeguard her preps, Becky is starting security training with her friend, a professional contract sniper whose identity must be concealed due to the high-risk nature of his occupation. So Bob, let's call him, he used to work in Iraq protecting officials He's been in a lot of rough situations. What kind of situation are we talking about? We're talking about like civil unrest kind of thing? Yeah, like if the government takes over. And what kind of weapons do you have? Yeah, that's what I was gonna show you. A stun gun is a non-lethal weapon that can only be used in close proximity when the electrodes are pressed against the attacker. That'll do the trick if somebody is right in your face and on right. top of you, right. okay? But. The, the, the key to this is, yeah. is you don't want to get that close. Okay. If intruders broke into Becky's home in search of food and water, her stun gun would only protect her temporarily and only okay. as far as she could reach. Yeah. How about this? Okay. A poker. Okay, we're getting someplace now. I would definitely use it as a club. Okay. Okay. So swat. Yeah, not swat. Hit him like a home run. Okay. Okay, across the head. Bob is scary sometimes. I know he's trying to make me better, but it makes me nervous. Bring all your weight down. Like that. That's a good start. We're gonna have to get you a firearm so you don't have to worry about this. Okay. I don't have a gun. I'm a girl. I'm feminine. I'm not supposed to love guns, right? But you get in a different mentality when you're protecting your family and your home and the things that are most important to you. An estimated 17 million women own or carry a firearm. And although Becky is not one of them, Today, she is taking Bob's advice and is learning how to defend herself with a lethal weapon. When the government takes over, I will need to know how to shoot a gun. I will need to protect my food and my water, kill an animal, or to defend my friends and my family from predators of any sort. Just line your sights up. You want to concentrate on the front sight? Just squeeze the trigger. Don't jerk the trigger. Move your hand and grab it like that. No, 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 no. Shoot with your dominant eye, but leave both eyes open. Can you do that? No. No? Not yet? OK, we'll work on that. You're going to have to learn to do that. Yeah, I can't do that. A hand pistol is ideal for engaging an enemy in close quarter combat when used with quick, accurate fire. But in a government takeover, Becky believes she will need offensive as well as defensive weapons. So if necessary, she can preemptively eliminate a threat without being detected. Today, with Bob's expertise, she is training with a bolt-action sniper rifle outfitted with a telescopic lens that guarantees optimal precision from up to 1,000 yards away. I'm taking sniper training because then I could keep people as far away from me as I needed to. This hand goes underneath. You support it. Okay. Make a fist. Pull it tight into your shoulder. You want me to have it dead center vertically, right? Today, Becky's bullseye is 200 yards, the equivalent of two football fields. You hit it. Did I? Yes. Sweet! Hit. Three for three at 200 yards. Not quite five for five. I got three out of five. If there's a government takeover, I need to be five for five, so I need to improve on that. We're going to need all of this if and when this happens. Becky, the experts, practical preppers, commend you for training with a weapons expert and trying to involve other people in your prepping. However, if you have to leave Salt Lake City within a matter of minutes, it will be difficult to carry your supplies. That's why I have a big frame hiking backpack, and so that's the thing that I would take if I were on foot. Also, they advise that you create a water filtration system in case your city's water supply becomes compromised. I totally agree that I need more water. I'm working on that. Your food storage is adequate for yourself, but not for your friends. Keep pushing them to make sure they are prepared. I have enough food storage for myself because that's who I'm planning for. 
I agree also that I need to teach my friends because friends can quickly become enemies if you're in a hostile situation. While martial law has been declared intermittently throughout American history, it has not happened at a national level in the modern age. This constitutional power has only been used on small scales to regain order during an extreme crisis, such as Hurricane Katrina, when local governance broke down.